yes father oh we reverence you lord lift up your voice let heaven hear your voice you want to praise him let him hear your voice let him hear your voice express your your worship to him tonight hey lift up your voice let him hear your voice let him know lord you are god you are the alpha and the omega like who satan he inhabits the praises of his people you want to praise god tonight i ain't like a satan the author and the finisher of our faith. Like all Satan, my secretary, if you know what the Lord wants to do for you tonight, you will not be quiet. You will praise Him from the depths of your heart. You will praise the Lord tonight. Like all Satan, my secretary, my A quick testimony. You know, yesterday, um, our sister Kenyatta, she's delivered a baby boy. Asha Samuel is here. Praise the Lord. You know, she called me at three o'clock and she said, Oh, I'm nine centimeters dilated. And um, and um, Asha's um, Asha's um, breathing was getting reduced. And the, the doctor said, oh, we're going to have to, if you don't deliver in the next hour, we're going to have to do a C-section. You know, she was already nine centimeters. And so I said, say no more. We are praying for you. I prayed with her on the phone and I said, pastor. <laughs> I quickly called pastor. I was like, pastor, it's like there's fire on the mountain. And as we were praying, pastor said, Asher Samuel, come forth. We are waiting for you. Asha Samuel, come forth. We are waiting for you. No operation. Asha Samuel, come forth. We are waiting for you. We are ready to welcome you. Your family is ready to welcome you. Guess what, guys? <laughs> you know, Pastor said, call her. Tell her the baby is coming. I called her, she didn't pick up her text. I said, sis, the baby is coming. Praise the Lord. You know what? She delivered for 10. An hour later, without C-section. Because why? The Lord has spoken. He said, I shall somewhere come forth. You know, this is our testimony here. I want you guys to give God praise. Shout to him. Praise our king. Hey, Kalamano, Sataliana. Father, we have come to say thank you. You know? In this house, at communion house, we always recognize whatever God is doing here. We don't take it for granted. We are like the one that came back to say thank you. You remember when, the, when Jesus healed the ten lepers? One of them came back and said, Lord, I have gone. I have come to say thank you. The one that came back, what happened to him? He was made whole. The Lord had it to his healing. The Lord had it to his blessings. This is why we don't take Thanksgiving for joke. We don't take it for granted him. Amen. And so I want us to give God praise for that because you know like what happens with the prophetic when you have a pastor who is a prophet in your life you are blessed the prophetic does not only see what's happening in the spirit they create they call it forth and the Lord backs them up that is the blessing that we have at communion house I want you to praise God that who are we that you are mindful of us who are we that you will bless us with this prophetic word here like who sataliana my second element sataliana lemokuria nisata oh father we say thank you in Jesus name amen so tonight <laughs> what the Lord wants to do in your life you have to be ready to testify 
you have you see was it last week we started practicing our testimony the Lord said to me last night he said this is your prayers today because if I don't hear from the Lord I won't come up here and he said for my name's sake I was like what does that even mean for my name's sake so what it means is that God is going to deliver you for his name's sake it is not for you to take the glory when you know you are ready to testify and say this is what the Lord has done for me <laughs> for his name's sake he is ready to do it for his name's sake you know God when God wants to do things for his name's sake God wants to show off his abilities he wants to show off his power he says for my name's sake for my name's sake <laughs> listen this prayer is not about you because sometimes we want to testify and we're like, oh, God has done amazing things and you want to keep it to yourself. Mm -mm. It's not this type. If you know that this testimony, you want to keep it to yourself, it's not this time to pray. Because this testimony is for his name's sake. It is not for your own glory. Remember last week we started talking about prayer of supplication. When is an, is an humbled prayer, a prayer of plea. This one is going into that as well. Like for his name's sake. For his glory. Let me read us a few scriptures. You see, um, Psalms 106 verse 7. Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. Hey, hey, that is not our portion in Jesus' name. They did not remember the multitude of your mercies. But they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake. So your deliverance, your salvation is for his name's sake. He said what? He saved them for his name's sake. That he might make his power known. <laughs> Psalms 31 verse 3. He says for you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore for your name's sake lead me and guide me. The Lord wants to lead and guide you to your place of plenty. You don't want to go? Did you hear me? The Lord wants to lead and guide you to your place of plenty. He wants to lead and guide you to still waters. You have been toiling all night. He wants to lead you to where the fishes are. Ah, for his name's sake. <laughs> Mark 8, 35. He says, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever, lo whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For his name's sake. For his name, because for some people, without signs and wonder, they will not believe. Without signs and wonder, they will say, oh, this God that you've been serving, what's the evidence? This is the evidence that God wants to give to you. For his name's sake, when you go around and say, Father, my God healed me. You know, when Sister Z came out, when she came here the first time, she said, my hands got healed for his name's sake. That God was like, oh my God, this daughter of mine, she came to testify just one. I am going to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that she has for. She only came to testify. She said, I got healed while praise and worship was going on. The Lord said, yes. You guys remember? She was running around here. She was praising God for his name's sake. She did not keep the testimony to herself. And God said, you know what? Ah, this is the type of this is the type of daughter I want because I'm going to do exceeding abundantly and when the Lord healed her of high blood pressure and diabetes what did she do she came back again to testify for his name's sake so tonight <laughs> tonight for his name's sake what is that thing or those things that you desire concerning you concerning our children what are those things that you desire for his name's sake no one is taking the glory for this it is not how oh, I know how to pray this is not how oh, I know how to worship no that's not about it it is about you praising God and saying Father for your name's sake for your name's sake lift up your voice and begin to pray because you are going to testify you are going to testify Father for your whole name's sake you will save our children for your name's sake oh God you will save our children from judgment for your name's sake let mercy prevail on our children. Father, for your name's sake, for your name's sake. Hey, Kalamano, Sataliana, Lemano, Satelemaku, Sataliana, Zekane, Lemano, Sataliana, Father, for your name's sake, we will not lose any of our children. 
children, for your namesake, we will not lose any of our children. Let that lose a Italian, for your namesake, signs and wonders, miracles will follow us. In the name of Jesus, my cool Italian, my second animal shot Italian, for your Lord, for your namesake, I call fast multitude. In the mighty name of Jesus, for your namesake, supernatural wealth is our passion. Supernatural wealth. Is our passion for your name's sake, my constant animal, my cool Satanian, my set animal, shut up, never know, second day, fire for your name's sake, I come for healing in the name of Jesus, for your name's sake, I come for deliverance, for your name's sake, my cool Satanian, my set animal, shut up, my cool name is Satan. We give you praise, we give you praise for your name's sake, for your name's sake. Our crook and pass, our main strength, for your name's sake. Ah, make us Italian, never lose Italian, make us a cool Italian. For your name's sake, our business is prosper, our business is prosper. For your name's sake, for your name's sake, we have good health, we have good health. Make us Italian, let me Italian. give you praise. Lord, we exalt you. If you know you are one of those people that will testify, jump on your feet and begin to rehearse your testimony. If you know you are one of those that will testify, give the Lord praise. Give him praise. Give him praise. Hey, Kalamano, Sataliana. Oh, Father, we thank you. Oh, thank you, Father. We give you praise. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your goodness. <laughs> oh, Lamano Sataliana. Thank you for your goodness. Hey, Lamika Sutali Sataliana. Oh, for your namesake. Oh, Father, for your namesake. Oh, we will experience mercy. For your namesake, goodness and mercy shall follow us. For your name's sake, this week we will come back with testimonies. For your name's sake, favor will speak for us. Ah, like I saw Toliana, Lima no Sataliana. Lord, you said we shall decree a thing and it shall come to pass. Oh God, for your name's sake. Ah, like who Sataliana. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you for our fighting our battles. Oh, we give you praise. Oh, the children at communion house, they are for signs and wonder. For your name's sake, we will not lose any of our children. For your name's sake, yes, Lord. Ah, Lika Sutaliana. Oh, Lemano Sutaliana. Oh, Father, we give you praise. We exalt you. We glorify you. Give the Lord a big shout of praise. Prophet, if I could just have a couple of minutes, just a couple. Thank you, sir. You see, because I heard the instruction of the woman of God about the testimony, and when I heard about my dear sister, Kenyatta, I was, I was fired up. Several days, my wife and I were in the hospital waiting for my son to come. And we dealt with so much opposition that about a week we were there. When her water broke, she said, baby, I'm ready to go. We said, okay, that was a Friday, we went in. And when we got there, they said, oh, you, you're not quite ready. We said, no, we wanna be here. They said, okay. And 
the one that was assigned to us, the provider, she said, hey, you know, have you considered C-section? No, we have not. And that was that. You see, because the Lord is dealing with us and pressing through. And so several days went by where we went through such opposition from the provider staff concerning the word of God that we were standing on, that my son shall be birthed through the birth canal as the Lord has created, as the Lord has ordained. Family, I'm trying to tell you, it got to the point where the woman came in, they tried to submit to us paperwork to say you have refused medical advice. I don't care. We kept pressing on. All the while, the man and woman of God, we were on the phone with, I say, look, prophet, we stand on the word. This is what we got to do. This is what we want to do. And as the woman of God was encouraging us, when you have that covering in your life to be able to go before, to seek that counsel, because the scriptures say that there's wisdom in the multitude of counsel. As we were receiving the instructions and standing on it, it got to a place to where we were speaking spirit to spirit. As the provider would come in and say, well, what if the child dies? I said the word of God concerning that child is that he shall live and not die. I said, woman, this is your last time spewing this contrary word or we will report you accordingly and you send us another provider. Family, three, four days we went through this. And about that fourth day, there was one that the Lord had sent. And when that provider had come, he was so gentle. There was something about him that was just, he, he felt like that granddaddy that you love. And he came in and about the time that the child was speaking through, we say, this is the moment, okay, the child is coming. They send an anesthesiologist to say, hey, you know, if you want to have these medicines while you're going through, we can have that. And then he started very cunningly saying, you know, well, if this happens, we can prepare. Would you like to come to where we have the, the tools and the medicines already handy so you don't have to be in this room? I was unctioned quickly by the Holy Spirit. Do not go into the territory of that room. You stay where you have built the altar. Oh, come on, somebody. You stay where you have built the altar. You see, it's times where, I, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, when it was time for my son Caleb Elijah to come, and the child came, the anesthesiologist stood in the corner right here. So all of this is going on. He stood right here. And the anesthesiologist still had someone with him. And he was... By this time, y'all, I'm tired because we've been standing on the word. We're like, okay, son, you got to come. The doctor was here, the one that we know the Lord had sent, right in front of my wife, ready to get the child. He said, get out. And he sent the anesthesiologist out. How many times did the, the Lord come and he had to send people out of the way because something, mad, it, oh, come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. He sent them out. And within a few minutes, the child had come. I'm here to tell you, life and death are in the tongue. Do not despise. See, I want y'all to hear this. Do not despise humble beginnings because that power that the Lord is growing you in, he got to teach you how to wield it. He got to teach you how to wield that life and death. He got to teach you how to wield the power. So when you come under the weight, when you come under the pressure, Lord, I'm standing on your word. Lord, I'm standing on it. Because when you come about, you've been built up with the power to call in Shadavasiyeta. You've been built up with the power to declare life to a situation. Shikadavasi. We give God praise because we have been instructed to give our testimony. How did they overcome Satan? By their testimony and the blood of the Lamb, not loving their lives unto death. Why don't you give God praise with me? Hallelujah. Because you got to know when you get ready to birth that thing, you got to push. When you get ready to birth that thing, you got to push. And you got to stand on the word of God for it's very active. 
is living, is powerful, is piercing to the marrow, divided soul. You got to know that the word of God is for you. The man of God said, forget not his benefits. See, my wife and I had been holding this thing in because we were so tired. We were so wore out from standing. But we give God praise because this is our season. We arise, shine, for our light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon us. While we're in this presence of God, why don't you go love on somebody? Greet someone with the holy kiss. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's make our way back to our seats if we can. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise. It's such an honor and a privilege to be in the midst of fellow believers standing on the word of God. And as we prepare to receive the one that the Lord has sent before us, let us continue standing. If you sit down, that's okay. Go ahead and stand up again and let's give the honor that's due. Father, we give you praise. Let's take just about 30 seconds to pray in the Holy Ghost concerning this one. Father, we give you praise for your spirit makes perfect intercession. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this prophet, this mighty man of God that you set before us. Lord, now grant unto us the ear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the churches. All glory and honor belong to you, O God. Let us welcome and celebrate the set man of this house, the pastor, the prophet, Moses Anderson. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. Praise the Lord. happen every day and I'm here for my own miracles happen everywhere and this is the place for mine I am pressing in I am taking it all today is my day I have my miracle miracle happens every day and today is mine I declare over you today in the mighty name of Jesus that which I have heard the angels of the Lord speak over you in the spirit the miracles happen every day. You have heard about it. And now it's time for others to hear about yours. God bless you. Be seated in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. God bless you, man. Be seated. Hallelujah. God is good. All right, all right, all right. I don't know about you, but I was like really excited about the prayer sessions that we had. You know, we have come to the season and to the time of the watchman. How many people were here on Tuesday and you remember me saying that, that we are now in the season of the watchman? Come on now. Praise the Lord. 
God is good. God is good. God is good. Uh, we're going to have more of that by the grace of God. I'm certain of it. I want to, first of all, um, actually, I want to welcome my brother, Don. Good to see you. Yeah, it's been a minute. All the way from Arkansas. Good to see you here. And uh, let's every, let, let everyone ball hat. Yeah, she's, she's been gone for a minute. Welcome back, Mary Ann. Good to see you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So at least the next time she's thinking about disappearing, she'll remember the, uh, the repercussion of that. So I'm going to just quickly talk about a couple of things. I don't want to keep us tonight. It wouldn't be my desire to um, because already there is so much impartation that has happened already. You know, because when I was there and my wife was praying and, and sharing the testimony about the delivery of the baby, I think actually when she called me, it was about 11, I mean not 11, 3.15 in the afternoon. And going into 3.20, I was at the bus stop waiting uh, to pick up William. And so when I saw that the baby came at 4.10, that was less than an hour. And we were given an hour. And you know, every now and again, the Holy Spirit loves a challenge. Because when my wife said to me, the doctor said, the baby has to come in an hour, otherwise they'll bring out the knife. Immediately, there was a holy anger that rose within me. It was almost as if, how dare you give us an ultimatum? You see what I mean? And then Alan came, and if I, before he came up, I was almost going to ask him to share his testimony, himself and Diamond, because they had been through a similar um, situation. And I'm glad that by the Holy Spirit, he was led to come out here and to do what he did, which lets us know, as the Word of God says, that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, a matter will be established. So I want you to tap into that grace, into that power of being able to receive a delivery of that which may have been pending. If there is anything in your life that's been pending for so long, a baby, a baby miracle or a miracle baby, an anointing level, or a grace level, an abundance level, whatever it is, a proximity with God level, whatever it is that has been long delayed in your life. As these words of testimony have come forth today, why don't you tap into it and push out your own baby? Whatever that thing is, just say that life has given me an ultimatum and I am calling it forth. This is 2023, the year of going forth. We will go forth and things will come forth on our behalf. In the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now, one more thing that I'm going to say before we, in fact, as we get into it, is this. Let me tell you something. There was a time that I was praying here right from the worship into the intercession that I noticed that anyone who came into the room who is, an, who is unfamiliar with Pentecostal behavior. And what I mean by Pentecostal behavior, I'm not talking about the denomination, but I am talking about the day the Holy Spirit came down in Acts chapter 2. Anyone who is unfamiliar with genuine Pentecostal behavior will take me for a drunken man. And the allergies don't help because when you see my eyes right now, one of them is really red like I've been smoking something. And so if anybody walks in and they see me, red eyes and, you know, speaking and spinning all over my face, they'll be like, yeah, for sure. He's on, he's, he's on something. Oh yeah, it totally must be. And, I, and then it occurred to me, even in that very moment, that the examples that we have in scripture of people who prayed were examples of men and women mistaken for drunken people. It's not just a manly thing to do. It's not just a woman thing to do. When Hannah prayed, even the high priest who was born and raised in the temple, who was always in the house of the Lord, this man had seen all sorts. Even on the day himself was like, this one is different. This woman must have dr drunk before coming here. The high priest Eli concluded within himself that the woman was drunk because he was observing her and she was praying with the kind of prayer that he had never seen. How did I know that? He said the woman's mouth was moving, but no words were coming out. This must be booze at work. Let me tell you something. Do you know that it is one of the prescriptions that we have in scripture to pray with all manners of prayers? 
You see, your prayer doesn't have to be American. Your prayer does not have to be European. Your prayer doesn't have to be African. Your prayer has to be diverse. It has to be all manners of prayers. You can't afford to be gentlemanly about prayer. You are a gentleman when you have won victories and you're sitting in your castle upon your spoil. But when you are at war, you cannot afford to be a gentleman. Imagine going to battle and keeping one arm behind your back and taking strides while swords have been swung at you because you say that you are a gentleman. No, you are only a gentleman when you have gone to battle and have had victory and confident that no enemy will rise for another 10 years because you have dealt with them to their very foundation. And so I want to encourage you that when you look at scriptures, the apostles, the, the converts who were awaiting, the apostles plus the converts who were awaiting the coming of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts chapter 2. The Bible says when the day of Pentecost was fully come and they were in one place and in one accord, there came from heaven a sound as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the room where they were and there appeared upon each and every one of them divided tongues as a fire and they began to speak in unknown tongues. They started to speak in other tongues and the men who were around the area mistook them for drunken men because they were not composed. They were not organized. They were not rhythmic. They were gyrating under the influence of the Holy Spirit. When Paul and Silas prayed, there was a place where they went to and people were like, yeah, these ones are drunk. When Jesus prayed, his prayer was such that he was sweating and his sweat was as thick as blood. Whenever you're praying and you don't think you will break a sweat after five minutes, tell yourself you are not started just yet. And I have a disclaimer, you know, because it's very difficult, or maybe not very, it could be a little challenging for my wife and I to tell people to pray in all earnestness and with all zest. Because it's easy for you to say, well, that's how Africans pray. But don't you think I pray like that because I am African? Because I know some Africans who pray whose voices you can't hear either. You understand what I mean? Think about it this way. If it aligns with what's in the scripture, don't let anybody else take that identity from you. You assume that identity. That is the kind of praying that I see in scripture. When you pray, let heaven know that you are praying. When angels come into the room, let them, even if they're going to Anita, be praying in one corner so loud that they say to Anita, let's take care of her first. Otherwise, we can't even talk to you because this will be too loud. You understand what I mean? Because you know, there are instances like that wherein we are too respectful and no, maybe not respectful. We need to be respectful of the things of the spirit all, all the time. But we're too civilized and too courteous to engage and encounter the power. Remember when Jesus was going to the house of, uh, what's the guy's name? Darius to, to raise his daughter from the dead. He was already said that I am going to perform a miracle. But the woman with the issue of blood was not going to say, well, you know, Jesus' schedule is kind of full today. He's already got someone he's going to go minister to. I don't want to be a nuisance. She couldn't care less about how she was perceived. This lady saw an opportunity to receive a breakthrough that she may never get a chance to engage ever again. And she went for it. Do you know that many a times we think that maybe we'll catch God another day? Be careful, the God you want to catch another day because to him a thousand years is like a day and a day is like a thousand years. What if that other day is the thousand years that he was talking about? The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Alan read to us from Numbers chapter 23 verse 23 that says there is no sorcery against Jacob, neither is there divination against Israel. He says, now let Jacob, let the people of God say, now let them say. The Bible says, look, you know that they're trying to bewitch you. You know that they are casting spells. You know that Satan is going around like a roaring lion seeking whom to devour. And you want to pray another day. The Bible says, even though the Lord says there is no divination against you, that there is no enchantment against you, he still wants you to say something. He says, now say what the Lord has done. You know, many of us will try to conclude in our hearts that the Lord is good. We'll try to wrestle and do all the battle without opening our mouths. 
Whereas the Bible says that the sword of the spirit is the word of God. David says, while I was yet keeping quiet, my bones began to weaken within me. He says, I believe, therefore I speak. Speak. If you truly believe, then you must confess with your mouth unto salvation. Many of us would like to have conversations with God in our minds because we believe that God is the gentleman of the heart and he can hear you. But that same God that you're speaking to silently is a God who speaks. And the Bible says his voice is like thunder upon many waters. So whose child are you and which God are you conversing with? Do you know that the devil is very capable of engaging us in conversations in our thoughts so that we don't speak? Because he knows that the moment you speak, he has no defense against the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God that is in your very mouth. You see what I mean? And so you cannot just be there thinking of all the things that you need. When are you? The Bible says with the heart, a man believes unto righteousness. But with the mouth, confessions are made unto salvation. No matter how much you meditate and think, you still have to speak. In fact, biblical meditation is incomplete without active confessions, without active proclamations. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, he says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. The Bible did not say it will not depart from your thoughts. He said it will not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night. So biblical meditation is not just a silent word silent musing biblical meditation requires active proclamation of that which you know that the lord has done if god has done it i still have to speak it let me ask you a question have you seen in your own life everything that god has already done if you have then you're no longer alive you're just visiting us from heaven hi thanks for stopping by but every single one of us, as long as we are here, that's what the word of God says. The Bible says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men that which the Lord has in store for those who put their trust in him. I haven't seen everything that the Lord has done, but I believe that he has perfected all that concerns me. So what do I do when I believe? I speak so that those things can become the reality of my time. The word of God is not just operational in time. In fact, the word of God in its default state, you know where it is? The Bible says forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. The word of God is forever settled in eternity. So if you want to see that word of God functional in time, you, the agent of time, has to say something. I say right here, right now. I need to see the word right here. Because if you don't speak, he doesn't change who God is. His word is forever settled in heaven. He doesn't owe you anything. He has already given to you. The Bible says he has already given to you all that pertains to life and godliness. He has blessed you past tense with all spiritual blessing. And for the English people here, he has blessed you past participle with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places. He has already. But you're like, uh, but I'm still missing one or two things. That is not God's problem. That is your responsibility. I know we need to sometimes make that distinction. Somebody reached out to me earlier today. And he says to me, he says, man of God, he says, what, whose responsibility is it when the sheep is lost? Is, is it the responsibility of the sheep to be found or the responsibility of the shepherd to find the sheep? When I saw that question, I laughed. And so my response to him was this. I said, my dear brother, T, I'm not going to say all his name. I said to him, you know, I should say his name. You know why? Because... He has a very prophetic name. And when I saw his question, I said, this question is coming from his spirit. Because his name is Thomas. Yeah, Diamond already knows where I'm going with this. Because like I've told you many times before, in every one of us, there is a Thomas. What is the meaning of Thomas? Thomas means the twin, Didymus. Every single one of us, there are two of us inside of us. There is that part of you that believes and there is that part of you that needs help. The Bible says the spirit is willing, but the flesh needs some lessons. The flesh needs therapy, even though the spirit is always ready. 
The man who came to Jesus with his son, he says, I believe, help my unbelief. So when he came to Jesus, he recognized that he was a didemos. He was a twin. There was a part of him that believes. There was a part of him that was yet to believe. Every single one of us, we have a part of us that is always willing, always ready. And that is the part of you that is born of God. He doesn't know anything else but the things of the spirit because itself is spirit. For the Bible says, whatsoever is born of the spirit is spirit. But whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. But each and every one of us, as long as we are in this facade, we need another kind of consciousness to be able to exist in this physical realm. And that consciousness is called the carnal man. Or the carnal mind. Because when you say carnal man, the women are always like, yeah, we ain't carnal. Those dudes, they are. Which is mostly true because women are kind of like a newer model than men. Slightly more refined. <laughs> yeah, they, they, women like me saying that. Some will say it because I think it works for me, especially hours later. If you know, you know. It took Cody seven seconds, but he got there in the end. Praise God for you. Oh yeah, I tell people, man was made from the dust. But God took the purest part of the man, which is his bone marrow that was not yet dirty. And that was what he used to make the woman. Now, I always wonder, where did the rest of the woman come from? I know he formed men from the dust. And then he took his bone and went somewhere, disappeared into his coven somewhere. And he just showed up with a woman. No record of her coming from the dust. And you know, God was very particular. When he brought Eve to Adam, the Bible says the Lord brought her to him to see what he would say. And he was like, oh, this is bone on my bones, flesh on my flesh. And she shall be called woman. And God was like, okay, okay. And then after a while, he called him aside. And he was like, I know she looks like bone of your bones and flesh of your flesh. He said, but don't get it twisted. She ain't like you. She's a weaker vessel. That word weaker vessel means a more delicate vessel. You understand what I mean? Because God is like, I don't want you to drive this one crazy. I want you to be gentle with this one because she didn't come from the dust like you did. She is two times over refined or many more. And when you look at it in reality, most women have softer skin than men. Yeah, we don't know where that material came from. It might be some kind of heavenly dust. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, come on now. It's, yeah, it's like the Rivian. We don't know where that came from. You see what I mean? And so... But the reality of it is because we all ate the fruit, we all have that carnal consciousness. Okay? So for once, let's all agree that women are as prone to Satan's temptations as the man is. In fact, the only times women are more prone to temptations is when the temptation is a temptation that is very far off in the spirit because most times women are more discerning. So they can actually accidentally pick up on a temptation before it happens. Oh, let me help you here by explaining that a little bit more. You see, men, until it hits us in the face sometimes, we don't know what's going on. It has to hit you in the face. You know, the temptation has to be in capital letters. But there are times wherein women, just because they begin to sense that you probably are doing something. In fact, you haven't even done it. You're going somewhere. You're going somewhere where one of your silly friends will sow a seed into you that could become a temptation in 21 weeks. But your wife already picks up on it. And she's like, you're not going to see Andy today. I'm like, why not? She's like, there's just something about Andy. I'm like, there's nothing about him. He likes to play golf more than the rest of us. But what? That's not wrong. I'm using Andy because there's no Andy here. You're welcome, guys. But the woman picks it up, picks it ahead of time. And so guess what happened? The devil knows that she has the gifting of discernment. And so he can also include the temptation for anger and unforgiveness even before the offense is committed. And that is the reason why when you mess up around a woman, she usually says, I knew it. Oh yeah. And so let me tell you something. Before the gravity of your offense unfolds, she has already unfolded everything and already unforgiven you in advance. You understand what I mean? Oh yeah, oh she's, she's already angry in advance. And you're there looking like a goofball and you're like, 
I haven't even said everything. Oh, you better not. And when I say you better not, what I mean is wait for her reaction first of all. Because she will still question you on everything. So just save the answers for the questions. Otherwise, you will, you will keep tying yourself in and in and in. Let me tell you something. I have bought things that I shouldn't buy. And my wife said, I knew it. And I haven't even told her the part of it that was not yet delivered. And I used to be like, oh, maybe when you see the other part of it that they haven't delivered, you may be happy with me. And she's like, oh, there is more. And I'm like, yeah. But now I wait until she asks me, so is this everything or is there more? I'd be like, oh, maybe I should check my Amazon yeah, because I know it's one blow is easier than the other. But where I'm going with this is this, folks. We need to recognize that there are two people in each and every one of us. There is that part of us that is born of the spirit, that is spirit. That part of us that is born of the flesh, which is flesh. Do you know that Apostle Paul, after having traveled half of the known world, witnessing and ministering the gospel with miracle signs and wonders following, he still had to deal with his Thomas situation with his diademos city, with his twin, with his dichotomy. He still had to deal with it. If you've read Romans chapter 7, you will appreciate what it means for a man to wrestle within himself and wondering why the Lord will not be the referee to separate his soul from his spirit. He was fighting, became vexed within himself. He says, that which I will to do, I do not. He said, but that which I will not to do is what I practice. Who will deliver me from this body of death, O wretched man that I am? He says, but I thank God that even though I obey the laws of sin in my members, with my mind, by my spirit, I obey the laws of God according to the inward man. Now let me tell you something, folks. There is that twin in each and every one of us. So don't be ashamed of certain questions that pop up in your mind. Rather than deny yourself, deliver yourself to the Lord. You know, because many of us, we want to impress God more than we want to be cleaned or we want to be saved. Do you know that I'm confident that it wasn't just Thomas that did not believe that that was Jesus standing in front of him. But Thomas was the only one who said, you know what, until I see, I do not believe. And he was okay. He owned it. Now, ask yourself, of all those people, how many other people actually got the privilege of putting their finger through the hole in Jesus' hand? The other people were satisfied with their self-righteousness and all their conclusions. But Thomas was like, I ain't doing that with y'all. I'm not assuming. I am asking. So there are times when you just have to lay bare before the Lord. And say, Lord, I believe. But somewhere within me, I'm still going to go and borrow that money. We do that all the time. We, oh, yes, we do that all the time. We're like, Lord, I believe you're my provider. But because I know sometimes you take your sweet time because you're God. I'm going to go help myself. Lord, I have prayed for this headache. But, because I know the last time I prayed for the headache, it took four hours. And I ain't got four hours because I need to watch the show. So what do I do? I go to take the Tylenol. You understand what I mean? That is what we do. We know what we believe, but we try to deny what we don't. When we were growing up, people used to say, when they're, when they're running a temperature and they have a fever, right? And you're saying to them, brother, are you okay? Be like, oh, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm good. Because faith is to say that you're good even when you're not. I'm like, uh, no, not quite. Faith does not deny the facts. It embraces the truth to change the facts. So when people are not feeling well, and the defense, the defense that we had was that the Bible says, let the weak say that I am strong. That is the defense. We're like, I'm weak, but the Bible says, let the weak say that I am strong. Yes. The weak will say that I am strong, but he will not say that I am not weak. Because even the Bible says, let the weak. So when they say, where are the weak? You first of all show up amongst the weak. We are the ones who are weak. We need help. But now that we have identified as weak, which is the fact, we will now confess the truth, which is the word of God that says that I am strong. You didn't find nothing. So nothing was lost. That was Siri. So this is what we do with the Thomas that is on the inside of us. If there is any area wherein you are struggling, let the Lord know about it. 
revealed that doubting Thomas to him and let him. Many of the scriptures we quote today are God's answers to questions people asked when they were struggling. Let me say that again. Many of the scriptures that we have today that shed light into the divine nature of God and God's expectation for this partnership that he has with us are answers or they were answers to questions that some people asked. On Tuesday, we broke down what it means to be born again. What if Nico had not asked Jesus, what must I do to be saved? Because the other guys just assumed that they were already saved because they were following Jesus. They didn't ask if there was any further requirement. Peter didn't say to Jesus, uh -huh, Jesus, are you sure that it's okay for us just to follow you? Are we going to make it? It was just like, we're following Jesus, we're good. But Nicodemus was like, there must be, there might be more. I don't want to assume. So he came to Jesus by night when all the naysayers and all the hypocrites and all the religious sanctimonious people were gone. He said, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, unless verily, verily, I say unto you, John chapter 3 verse 3, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So if you are benefiting from questions people ask the Lord Jesus, why are you afraid to ask yours? God knows exactly where you are, how much you believe and how much you don't. So why don't you do yourself a favor and let God know exactly where you are at. Let me say this, you're not you're not hiding from God your weaknesses, not necessarily because you want to impress God. We hide our weaknesses from God because it is what we inherited from Adam. When Adam and Eve sinned, nobody told them to go into hiding. The serpent already did the damage. He was already getting ready to receive the title deed in his name. He, all he wanted, he thought he had achieved. Nobody, he didn't say to them, uh, now that you've eaten the fruit, you better hide. The big boss is, big boss is coming. No, the, something within Adam just told him that he needed to hide from the Lord. So it is inherent within us in the Adamic nature that we should hide certain things from God because we really aren't proud of certain things. But in reality, when you think about it, this same God, he knows you more than you know yourself. Cain did not even know that there was more temptation waiting for him. He was still struggling with what he had done. And God came to him and said to him, he says, there is more temptation outside. He says, sin is waiting for you at the door. And the man was inside. There was no way he could have known. So God already knows what you are even about to struggle with that you haven't struggled with. So I'm encouraging you, when you have these situations within you, ask the teacher and let him explain to you what you must do to be saved. Tell him you believe, but that there is unbelief and let him help your unbelief. I don't have to impress God because he knows me. I don't have to impress God because God is very much interested in partnering with me in remediating my shortfalls. The Bible says the Lord desires to show mercy. So when this man asked me, Brother Thomas, he says, who is responsible for the salvation of the sheep, the shepherd or the sheep itself? So I, I smiled and I said to him, I said, well, first of all, the very simple answer is that the shepherd is primarily responsible for the sheep. And there are so many scriptures. I'll give you some of the ones that I gave him. Romans, in fact, before Romans, you know, if you look at I believe it's Matthew chapter 12. The account of the lost sheep. You all remember the lost sheep? When the sheep was lost, the one out of the 100. Was it the other sheep who said to the shepherd, Shepherd, you're slacking. One of us is lost and you're here. Trying to sleep. Texting your mom. No. It was the good shepherd himself who recognized that one of his was missing. And he went looking for it. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5 verse 8 that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we were still the enemies of God, he left his throne and took on the form of a man and took all that risk to come and die for us. So God made it very clear or has made it clear in his word that whenever you and I are lost or struggling, it is not our primary responsibility to come out of the situation that we are in as much as it is God's responsibility to bring us out. 
God says I'm the provider. So when I am broke, it is not my responsibility to do everything that I can to come out of being broke. No, it is his responsibility to prove himself. He says, I am God and I am your provider. Okay, if you are the provider, do your thing. Look at what my wife reminded us of today. Very golden truth from the word of God. She kept saying that God has come to us in his name. For his name's sake, he will do things for us. Psalms 23, all of those promises was for his name's sake. He's doing all of those things because he says, I'm the good shepherd. And what does the good shepherd do? The good shepherd will lead you beside still waters and will restore your soul, will take care of you, will make sure that you are not taken advantage of by the hyaline, will make sure that you are under his, his wings so that you are not exploited by the wolf. That is what the good shepherd does. But I haven't said that. Salvation becomes more proactive, happens more speedily when the sheep knows its own responsibilities. Do you know that if you as a shepherd, you're trying to save a sheep and the sheep keeps running around in anxiety and in frustration, you may not find it easily. That is the reason why the Bible says that the good shepherd will lead the sheep beside still waters. Because I need you to calm down. I am looking for you to save you. The last place that I remember seeing you was in that room. That is the first place that I'm going to go to. And when I get there and I don't see you because you have gone into the next room looking for the shepherd or looking for salvation yourself, you become even more difficult to find. Many of us, the peace of God that is beyond understanding is looking for us, but anxiety and worry and self-help is not letting us get found easily. As a good shepherd, he will do what he needs to do. He's made a commitment to you for his name's sake to seek you that he may find you. But you need to be at rest. You need to stop being restless. Anxiety is what is driving majority of us away from the place of our miracle. Because we get too anxious to wait for God. When we were growing up and we were learning how to swim, they told us, that if for some reason you find yourself drowning, the moment you recognize that help is near, stop struggling. Because it's very difficult to save a drowning man that is kicking and, spl and splashing for dear life. Because one wrong motion can swipe off existence, the one that is trying to save you. Because you know, when people are struggling to survive and they believe that their life is about to be over, the animal instinct within them comes and they become stronger than the chimpanzee. Because you know, apes are very strong. But when you look at their bone, it's not that much bigger than ours. The reason why we're not that strong is because something in our brain controls how much energy we throw out. But when people, have you ever seen someone possessed with an evil spirit? And now they can just kick a wall and everything comes crumbling down. And then on a good day, they can't even kick their shoe out of the way. You understand what I mean? Is my son listening? Yeah, you're able to kick your shoe out of the way. Let other people pass. You see, but we have all that energy when we're drowning or when, God forbid that we drown, but when the man is drowning, you don't want a situation when they hit you and you cannot save them. So typically when you're trying to save somebody, you wait until they're calm. Whether that is by understanding, they know to let go or by taking in enough water, they cannot even struggle anymore, then you save them. That is, yeah, you, yeah, that's, 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 if you're a lifeguard, you've been told that. It's life coach, what do they call it? Um, lifeguard 101. You learn that. So what do you do when you find yourself in a difficult situation? Before you try to save yourself. Do you know one day I asked the Lord, I said, please explain to me what you mean by calling on your name. The Bible says those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And there are certain times you and I both know that you've just said Jesus and nothing seemed to have happened. And so I said, I don't want to just say Jesus or just call your name. I want to know what it means. And you know what the Lord said to me? He said, what is the meaning of that name? Jesus means Yeshua. It's from the word Yeshua, which means God, our salvation. He says, don't call me until you know that I will be the one to save you. Some of us will call God 
as though we are the ones to save ourselves. And you're just calling God to come and witness the show. You scream and shout, almost as if it's your shout that will save you. No, I will scream and shout, but in my heart, I know who I am calling. So we need to get to that place always and at all times, wherein we know for sure that the Lord is the Savior and we are waiting for his mercy. But if you are not calling on God, have to have settled within your heart that he's the Savior, there is no way you can be at peace. You will be praying, but you will still be fearful. And such prayers do not leave the window of your room. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please, please God. The prayer of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. God only responds to the prayer of faith. So what do you do to demonstrate that you have faith? Be at peace. Not to impress God, but to actually demonstrate to all the forces that govern life that I am not here to save myself. I am here because I am confident in Him. The second thing that a sheep has to do to be saved is this. I asked the Holy Spirit after the man asked me that question and I sent him my response. I said, what is this about? He said, I sent him ahead of the others. He says, there are others today that you need to share these same things with who are wondering why salvation hasn't come. Who don't know or who haven't come to reason within themselves in understanding where the line is. Where do I draw the line between my responsibility and God's responsibility? I don't want to be a lazy child of God who is expecting God to spoon feed me and do everything for me. But then at the same time, I don't want to be wrestling with God for control over my life. So where do I draw the line? Draw the line by the two things that I've said primarily. Note that God's responsibility is God is ultimately responsible for saving you, but position yourself for a saving. The Bible says in John chapter 10 verse 4, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd and my sheep know my voice. Do you know that if you do not know the voice of the good shepherd, let me say this very slowly because I don't want us to miss it. If you do not know the voice of the good shepherd and you are a sheep that is lost in the wild, do you know that you could easily just jump out to the very first sound that you hear, which could be a bear or a wolf? Because there are animals in the wild who learn hunting by watching shepherds. So they would move around the sheep as though they are coming for a rescue, but they're just tempting the sheep to come out and show itself. And boom, there they are. They attack. That is the way Satan hunts. The Bible says, behold, your adversary is going around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he might devour. What is our cue for calling on the name of God on the last day when we hear his voice as the lion of the tribe of Judah? When you hear him roar and his roar tears open the heavens, what do you do? The Bible says, call upon his name and in that day you shall be saved. And so Satan knows that if he can sound like the roaring lion, you will come out expecting that it's Jesus and then he'll be like, got you. And so you need to know the voice of the good shepherd. You need to know exactly what God is saying so that you do not fall into the hands of Satan. So you're saying, God, I've been in this situation for too long. I need you to get me out. And the Lord is saying, well, I was walking by. I was calling out. But you didn't come out from where you're hiding. You need to know the voice of the good shepherd if you will be saved in the day of salvation. The other thing that we need to know, if we will be a sheep that gets found when we are lost, is to recognize, just like I said earlier on, that it is not just the shepherd that is looking for you. The higher lane is looking for you as well. The wild animals are looking for you as well. So what do you do? You need to be confident enough in your understanding of the workings of the good shepherd so that even though it seems like every other evil is passing by and you haven't seen the good shepherd, you will remain confident that that good shepherd will not sleep, will not slumber until he has saved me. Let me say that again very slowly. You see, quite often this is what happens to us. You get laid off from work and you're like, I'm a man of God, I can handle this. He will never leave me, nor forsake me. 
Oh, this is just to test my faith. And you're quoting scriptures. And you're doing that. That is only a job. I live by the word of God. Not by what monies they pay me. And then two weeks later, your landlord says he has sold his house. And now you're on your own. Because the company that bought it, they're demolishing it to build something else. So it's not one of those things where you can insist on staying there. And it's like, wow, okay. Okay, maybe, maybe I need more than faith this time around. Maybe I need a strategy, right? And before you know what's going on, something else comes and hits you, boom. Maybe somebody that you've been preaching to and ministering to just sends you a text message. I don't ever want to hear about your Jesus because of this and because of that. And you are just completely bummed out. Guess what happens? If you have not taken the time to understand the working of the Savior, you may mistake the series of challenges and troubles and calamities to mean that it was time for you to come out of your hiding. Because many of us, we're happy to wait on God and we're happy to wait for his intervention until we reach a threshold of attacks. And we're like, at this particular point in time, I need to do something because maybe Jesus is in the Bahamas. Maybe Jesus is on vacation, I don't know. But I don't want to find out. So I'm going to go help and save myself. And that is how many animals fall into the hands of their oppressors. Simply because they mistake one sound or one roar after another to mean that they need to do something to save themselves. I want to pray for you today that in the mighty name of Jesus, every pattern in your life that has caused you to jump the gun and try to save yourself because of oppositions will come to an end. That you will receive the divine ability by the Holy Spirit to be patient and to patiently wait for God's salvation. Because when we examine our lives critically and honestly enough, we will realize that there have been many times or one time too many that we have decided to apply for a job or to accept an offer, not because the Lord has spoken, but because your problems have spoken. The forces that govern life, they were made by God. And so they also have a voice. But if the good shepherd is going to come and rescue you for his name's sake, he would have to do it to a sheep that knows his voice. A sheep that knows him and understands that that good shepherd will not sleep nor slumber. Jesus said that that shepherd did not sleep, did not slumber until he found the one and brought him home in the early hours of the morning. So I want to encourage you today. Tell yourself, I'm done running. Any running that I am doing is only going to be to the Lord. I'm done running from things. I'm done running from troubles. I'm done running because I am not meant to run from things. When you think about it in reality, you are too big to run from those problems. We need to know. I told my wife, I literally woke her up about maybe two days ago. She didn't even know why she woke up. The reason why you were awake when I was coming back into the room was because I left the room shouting in tongues from my sleep. And so by the time I came in, she was like, everything okay? I said, well, now that you're awake, I'm going to tell you the dream. <laughs> yeah, because I've been told off sometimes saying, I just want some sleep. I don't have to be in every one of your dreams. Yeah, go and pray. Let me sleep. And so I said, well, now that you're awake, I'm going to tell you what happened. In the dream that I was in, I was exercising. And then I was led in the spirit to go another way. And I knew that I was being led, so I went another way. So imagine, I left from that corner of the stage and I took a walk to that other corner of the stage. Naturally, I was supposed to just reverse my path and go back to where I came from. But I was led to come to this junction and then to go that way. By the time I got to that junction, I met two ladies. And they came to me as though they were celebrating me and respectful of me. And they were like, oh, uh, if I, there's something we know you're looking for and we've got it. And I'm like, okay. For a moment in my mind, I'm thinking, how would they even know that I am looking for something? I was like, okay, but it doesn't matter. If I was led to come this way, I'll give them the audience. 
So I followed them and once, just before we got to where I was coming from, they took a detour and they were like, oh, please come with us. So I followed them. They looked like they could be maybe in their 30s. But just before the detour, two teenage ladies showed up, one in red and the other one in blue. And they were trying to say something to me with their eyes without these other ladies knowing. And what they were saying to me was that I don't have to go that way. So in my mind, I was thinking, I was led to come this way. These other people say they have something that I may need. Who are you people? And suddenly it just hit me. They're warning me. I said, okay, I'm not going to stop following them, but I would take that one in and just put it in the back of my mind. So I went this detour. And when I took the detour, I saw a table, a wretched, rickety looking table. And these ladies who stood tall, maybe about five, six, five, four, they suddenly shrank to fit under that table. That table was no more than 18 inches off the ground. And when they shrank in there, they were like, oh, this is the person that will help you. She has the power that you seek. And I sought the permission of the Holy Spirit before sharing this thing because I know these beings represent oppositions that have come to test the power of God. And so when they said this is the lady, these are the people. They didn't say lady in particular, but the person looks like a lady that may be like 300 years old, skinny, un unnaturally skinny. And the skin was almost like purple. It didn't even really look like a human being. And so I was like, okay. For a second, I thought to myself, these ladies have been very respectful. They've been very courteous. I met them along the way where I was being led. And they said that there is some kind of power that I need. And so all of that was processing in my mind. And I was like, okay, let me stoop down. I stooped down. I saw the face of one of the people. There appeared to be two of them joined together. And one of the faces was the face, was the face of a baboon with gray hair sticking out. Now, if it was not in a dream, you and I both know, I would have disappeared. If I saw a person, a humanoid, skinny with long limbs, sitting there, and, and when these ladies shrank to fit under that table, I should have known that this is no territory for anybody to be. But because it was in the dream, you know how dreams are? In the dream, you feel like you are Superman. Everything is like, oh, everything is possible. So I was still going along with it. And then the moment I tried to go under that table, it just hit me. I'm like, for me to go under this table by design, I would have to bow myself and be bowed before. I said, oh, now I know who I'm dealing with. You know what scripture came to my mind? When Satan came to tempt Jesus. You know, Jesus was playing along at the beginning. Satan was like, oh, you know, if you are the son of God, turn the stones into bread. And Jesus was like, dude, man shall not live by bread alone. It is written. He was still entertaining. Then the next time he says, no, he quoted scriptures. And then when Satan came and said, if you would bow to me, Jesus said to him, he says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God, but he alone shall you worship. And so the moment that I noticed that for me to go and interact with those people, I need to bow myself. I'm like, these people are seeking worship in the promise of power. Immediately, I knew and I said to them, and then I chuckled. I said, I'm not going to bow before y'all. I know who you are. And one of the beings, because they were joined together, one of the heads came from the other side, tried to intimidate me to bow. I said, maybe you didn't hear me properly enough the first time. I said, I cannot bow to anyone but my father. That was what I said. You see, they were very subtle. They were very subtle because they were like, oh, just come. All you have to do is just come in here. And they were not bowing. They had shrunk and they were standing there like little idols. But I was still in my, in my own frame and form. You see, when I was telling Alan about the dream, I said one of the things that I learned from that dream is I learned to never forget that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You see, the moment you keep that operational in your thoughts, you will not compromise. People want you to compromise your standards. They want you to bow to them. You've already been told by the Lord not to work seven days a week. God already told you, Chris, I want you to rest one day. You, the Bible says, Jesus speaking, Jesus says, man was not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. 
You understand what I mean? And the reason why he told that to the Pharisees was because they were being burdened by the Sabbath. And Jesus says, no, the Sabbath is not meant to be a burden to you. It's meant to be a way of helping you ease the burden. God already told Chris, rest one day of the week. And then Chris has this employer who has a client. And the employer says, hey, Chris, if we don't make this client happy, we don't think our business is going to make it. And so now they want to make you bow to this client just because of bread. So what does Chris do? Chris says, oh, it doesn't matter. They can take their business and go to hell, but I ain't working seven days a week. It is what it is. Because look, I am bigger than that business. If the Lord would just open your eyes to show you tomorrow, you will still be here when that business is gone. I have had one business partnership after another where people have threatened me. Every single partnership that threatened me does not exist today. I say that to the glory of God because when they were threatening me, they looked at my status, they looked at my position and my age and they felt like they could tell me how to live my life. And every time that I said no to the opposition, the Lord elevated me and by the time I look around, they're nowhere to be found. I remember one of the very latest ones. I ran into the head of the partnership. I didn't even know he was in. I didn't recognize him anymore. He called me. And he was like, wow, long time no see. I said, yeah, long time no see. I said, how are things going? And then it was one war after another. He was like, oh, he suffered this. They have suffered that. This has happened and that has happened. And I just said to him, I was like, wow, sorry to hear that. That was what I said out loud, but in my heart, I said, blessed be the name of the Lord. Because I could have changed my mind on the things that I had already settled with God just to bow. For me to come under their table. Let me tell you something. The table that your heavenly father is preparing for you. Only he can bring you to that table. Because that table is bigger than where you're at right now. So don't let anyone or anything make you bow. This applies to young women who are dating. And the guy is going to tell you. If you don't let me have my way. I'm going to call off this engagement. Oh let me tell you something. That is a man that is too little for the destiny that God has for you. Because the destiny that God has for you is a destiny that involves a man who can bear the fruits of the Spirit. And the Bible says, and the fruits of the Spirit include love, patience, kindness. So if he's not patient, if he's not kind, kick him out of the way. You don't have to physically kick him. You just have to tell him off. You understand what I mean? So here is the deal. When I saw that in the dream, now, I could have forgotten who I was just because of some promise. So I looked at them in the eye and then you know what? One of the, the one in front, the being in front, continued to threaten and said to me, if you don't bow. So eventually they opened up when they knew that I had caught them. Initially, they didn't say bow. They said, come in here. I was the one who reasoned within myself. I know to, to come in there means to stoop to your level. I'm not doing that. And she said, if you don't bow, we will do this and we will do that. And the moment she said that, I got really vexed in the spirit. And I started to declare the blood of Jesus is against you. I am who my heavenly father says I am. That was what I was doing. I was quoting scriptures as I was coming out of the dream. Now, let me tell you this part of the dream that would help you if it happens to you. My voice started getting faint while I was quoting scriptures. They were threatening they were speaking some unknown demonic language. They were coming at me. I was speaking in tongues. I was quoting scriptures. And then my voice went faint. And the moment my voice went faint, for half a second, I was afraid. I was like, oh my God, this is a battle of words. And if I can't speak, how am I going to get out of here? You know what I mean? For a moment. And after a while, I was like, even if I say no more thing, the one that I have already said is more than whatever they can bring to this battle. Because I have spoken the word of God. And I woke up speaking in tongues and quoting scriptures. What I realized was the reason why my voice was getting faint in that realm was because my voice was already loud in the room where I was sleeping. Praise the Lord. And so I say all of that today to say this. Those two things that happened to me in the last couple of days, including Thomas's question and the dream that I had. The Holy Spirit, when I engaged him concerning those things, he said to share with you because they are not just one of experiences they're not experiences for me alone he says i am showing you some of the new strategies of the enemy 
against the church, against the body, against you and your brothers and sisters. So I want to quickly talk about two things and then we're going to break bread. You see, we have come to a point wherein our identity is being tested. The enemy wants to know whether you know who you are. Our identities are being tested. So no matter what you feel in your body, you are not your emotions. No matter what you feel in your body, you are not your flesh. You know, there are certain days wherein you are tired, too physically tired to pray. Go to sleep. The reason why I'm saying that is this, because some of us were too afraid to not pray. When we're not praying, we're like, oh my God, I should be praying. This tiredness is going to make me weak in the face of the enemy. No, when you are tired like that, just sleep. Because you are not just that flesh. Your spirit can be praying while you're sleeping. The Bible says that all things are lawful unto me because I am not under the law, because I am in the spirit. But guess what? It says, do not take that liberty as an occasion for the flesh. As long as you're not saying every night, oh, I can just sleep, my spirit will pray. No, do not deceive yourself. Whatsoever a man sows, that he shall reap. But if you know in your heart that you're trying to pray and you cannot pray. Let me tell you something. This last week, there were like two days or so that I wanted to pray and I couldn't pray because I was really tired, physically exhausted. The allergy was getting the better of me. You know what I did? I went to sleep. I told my wife, I said, the kind of dreams that I've been having lately wants me, want, is, is tempting me to sleep even more because I've been having dreams of full-blown conversations in the realm of the spirit that empowered me, woke up feeling divinely energized. And so if, if God knows that genuinely speaking, you are weak in your flesh, don't try to impress God by dragging yourself to do what you are not equipped to do because you are not just that flesh. There are certain times that you want to pray, but your thoughts are not settled. You are not just your mind or your emotions. Your spirit is consistent all the time. You are being tested. Know your identity in Christ and live up to who you are. So that's one. Identities have been tested. The other thing that is being tested has more to do with this sheep and shepherd scenario. You see, folks, God wants you to have this confidence that he has you covered no matter what. I know that is like a cliche. Many of us have been hearing that since we were children. Now, you know what? I don't have to worry. God has me covered, but then you worry. You say to yourself that, oh, you know what? I am who God says I am and this and that. And then after a while, you're like, uh, maybe. You see that maybe voice. You need to learn how to put that maybe voice in its place. To put the maybe voice in its place, I'm going to share with you a quick nugget from Isaiah chapter 58. And then we can break bread. Because the maybe voice sometimes requires for us to bring an old weapon. To deal with it. Isaiah 58 verse 14. Look at what it says. Isaiah 58 14. And I pray that the Holy Spirit is going to minister life to you from this scripture. Look at what it says. It says, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. Now. Verse 13. I'm going to read verse 13 just to give us some kind of preamble. He says, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the, of the Lord honorable, and you shall honor him not doing your own ways, not finding your own pleasure. I'm still reading Isaiah 58, verse 13. Not speaking your own words. Praise the Lord, Cody, thank you. Now, I said this earlier on, and I gave Chris as an example. His name is very prophetic. Chris means the anointing, because it's, it's a short form of Christos, which means the anointing, but it could also mean the anointed one depending on how you use it. 
So Christ is not Jesus' last name. Alrighty? So the way we have Chris Whitehead is not Jesus Christ. No. They call them Jesus Christ because he was the anointed one and he was the embodiment of the anointing. The word Christ is the anointing. So when I said Chris, the Lord has said to you, six days you shall work. One day you shall rest. It's because many of us do not recognize the fact that as long as we are working, sometimes we're not allowing the unction to work for us. And the Lord is saying that if you will honor my rest, I am the good shepherd, you're the sheep. If you wouldn't stop running around, if you give yourself a time to just wait on the Lord, to just rest in me and to honor me, you see, when you wait and you allow yourself to be at peace in the midst of trouble, you are honoring God. You are demonstrating that you're so confident in God that no matter where you are or how low you have fallen, his hand is not too short to save. God calls resting and allowing for him to look out for you and to look after you. God calls it honor. He says, if you would just honor me, and stop there without saying maybe. You see, there is this word maybe that we use to turn ourselves away from trusting in God. I know that this bill has to be paid. That has to be taken care of. And I know God is my provider. But maybe I need to do something. That maybe is always followed by your own intentions and your own ways and your own mitigation. And the Lord is saying, I do not want you. He says, not finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Let us speak the word of God and stop there. The moment you proceed beyond God's period, then you're adding your own words. So if I am in a difficult situation, there is somebody who is making my life difficult and I've already committed them to God, then I don't have to look for strategies of how to manipulate them to be kind to me. Because the Bible says that the heart of kings are in the hands of the Lord. And like the course of a river, he changes it where he wishes. I learned that lesson when I was about 11 years old. Because my dad wasn't saved at the time. And he wouldn't let us go to church all the time because it didn't make any sense to him. He kept saying that you, they're using you for cheap labor because you all go there, you sweep the floor, you cut the grass. How much do you get paid? How much do you get paid? Zero money. Stay home. It didn't make any sense. He was like, you know, you could have read a book. The time that you went for six hours, you could have read a book. You see, because he was always about what books you can read, how much knowledge you can acquire, what skills you can develop. He was very much in that space. There's nothing wrong with it, but you have to balance it out. And one day, I, I had just about had enough. By faith, I told my friends I would come to midweek service. I barely made it on Sunday. I barely made it on Sunday. And, so, and Sunday was not even as long as the midweek service because midweek service was in the evening. Our pastor thought what that meant was you had come to sleep at church so he preached for six hours. You see what I mean? So when it was midweek service, oh, the man would take his time. He would preach. He would tell stories. The same story he told last week, he'll tell it again. You see what I mean? And so I was like, I am pushing my, my, I'm pushing my luck, literally. I barely was able to go to church on Sunday and I boasted, I told my friends. I said, don't worry, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. And when Wednesday came, my dad was on leave, so he was in town. So I'm like, um, I'm going to church. I was practicing it in my room. I'm going to church, I'm going to church, I'm going to church, I'm going to church. Going to church. No. Because you have, you have to summon courage. Because I've tried it multiple times. I was raised in an African home. The fear of your dad was the beginning of well behavior or good behavior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just, you just know that there were certain things, you know. So as a teenager, we were troublesome at school. We, we made trouble in the park. But at home, we were angels. Because, I mean, that man was like a little god in the house. If he sneezes, you will wipe your face on his behalf. Anyway, so I was practicing what to do, what to do. And I just knew that I didn't have the confidence to go ask him. So I prayed. I said, Father, the heart of kings are in your hands. I want you to touch this man's heart. So that I do not have to beg to go. I'm just going to say that. I'm leaving. And he will say, see you later. That was my desire. So I prayed and I stayed in my room. Nothing happened. He didn't come to meet me. 
and I still didn't have the courage to go ask him, even though I had prayed. And so I summoned courage and I got up and I said, Dad, I'm, I'm going to church. It was like, if you don't get out of my face before I count three, I was so disgusted. I was like, what is the meaning of this? I prayed. But the Lord said to me, but did you wait? Someone didn't hear it. I prayed, but I didn't wait. You see, I knew that it wasn't yet time for me to go. But maybe I should do something. You see, those were my own words and they did not carry any power. So I learned that, you know what? If truly I believe that God can touch his heart, maybe I should believe that God would touch his heart for him to come to my room and say to me, why are you not going to church? Here is money. Don't walk today. Take a cab. I could have believed for that. And so you know what? I said the next time, what I'm going to do is I will pray that God touches his heart and wait until he says something. You know, there are certain times when you just have to know that when God says he's doing something, that you would see it when it is done. I learned that lesson. I mean, of course, it's not like I've practiced it all the time since then, but at least I've known it since then. Many times I still say my own, uh, maybe I need to do something. You see what I mean? But the Lord says, I don't want your own words. Once I have said it, let, my, let me have the final word. I am the beginning and the end. The author and the finisher. The first and the last. When God says it, believe it, confess it, but do not add your own words to it. So all that maybe voice that makes you restless, that disallows you from waiting for the salvation of God to be fully fulfilled, the Lord delivers you of it today. In the mighty name of Jesus. Now look at what the Bible says in verse 14. The Bible says in verse 14, Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. The Lord is doing a supernatural work in this place today. From the prayers that we said to this reminder word, what the Lord is saying to us in essence is this. I want you to pray confidently, declaring my words. Get to the place where you believe what I have said. Confess it loudly in different ways, using all manners of prayer tactics, from prayer to supplication to thanksgiving. And when all of that is done, having done all to stand, the Bible says, stand ye. Therefore, having done all of those things, stop strategizing how to help yourself. It is the Lord's Sabbath. Go into the Lord's rest and see what the Lord will do. He will turn the hearts of men. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, even those with a heart of stone, God will make it flesh. If I've already prayed, I don't have to write that email to try to manipulate them. If I've already prayed, I don't have to do anything. I don't even have to buy them a present. You see what I mean? Because I have prayed. For once, we need to give God a chance to prove himself as the good shepherd who will come and save us if we will be at rest. As we break bread today, I want you to remember the words of the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 2 verse 2. And that will be our breaking bread scripture today. Let's just even go there together. Colossians chapter 2, actually Let's go to uh, verse 7. Colossians chapter 2 verse 7. It says in verse 7, Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. You are rooted in faith. So why don't you just abound in that which you are already rooted in? You already know that the word of God says that you are above always and not beneath. So if you feel the urge to say something, if you feel the urge to help yourself in any way, this is what the Bible says you should do. Give thanks. So when you find yourself not being able to wait for God to move, start to give thanks. Occupy yourself with something. Instead of saying, oh, maybe I need to strategize and do this, thank God and say, God, I know that you're going to do it. I know that he will do it. Begin to sing a song in him because God does not want you to be uprooted by doubt or uprooted in anxiety or in restlessness. He says you are rooted in faith. I know you believed me when you saw that promise in my word. Stay rooted. If anything wants to move you, let it be praised because thanksgiving will not uproot you 
It will keep you busy. But it's not going to take you out of promise. I say this today because I know the things that I have seen. And I'm praying for you today that you also will see that the Lord does not want you uprooted anymore by every noise that you hear. Let me tell you something. In fact, let me say this prayer. It's a very interesting prayer, but I'm going to say it over you today. That the Lord would allow you to see the threat of the enemy from behind. Let me say this again slowly. This is something that the Lord's done for me and I believe that if you would have this revelation. You see, quite often when the enemy comes with his charade, it looks very boisterous. It looks very terrifying. But if the Lord would allow for you to see what the enemy is, what it really looks like from behind, you would not be afraid. Let me give you a practical example and that would probably excite you to receive the promise. You know, there are certain people in your life that have constituted an opposition. Maybe someone on your HOA who would not even allow for you to plant a single flower. Whenever a blade of wheat sticks out on your yard, it's writing you a letter. And it's like, how did you even see that blade? It just grew when you left your house to come here. You see, some of those people look so intimidating. If the Lord would allow for you to walk in this realm, you know the word of God that we just read in Isaiah says the, oh, the plan of God is he wants you to walk upon your high heels. When you walk upon your high heels, what it allows for you to do, it allows for you to be able to see the camp of the enemy and see all the fake plot that they're planning because you're already on a high place. When the Lord allows you to see that that person is not all of what they say they are, you will no longer be afraid. The Lord will help you to tap into this thing so you can neutralize the threat of the enemy that have kept you from possessing your possession. So let us break bread with Colossians chapter 2 verse 7. In fact, I knew that we were supposed to read verse 2. I'm just trying to save time. And I looked and I'm like, it's not even 9 o'clock. So let's read that verse 2. Let's read verse 2 because, you see, it helps us to appreciate better what God is saying in verse, in, um, verse 7. Alrighty, so 2 verse 2, it says that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of the Christ. The part of it that I want to bring out for us today is this. I've already said it, but this is the scripture for it. God wants you to have an understanding of how things work between the shepherd and the sheep, between your father and your soul. And this is what the Lord is saying. The Lord is saying that you may attain to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both the father and the son. Both the creator and his word. God wants you to not just know about him. He wants you to know the full mystery. You see, because it is the understanding of the mysteries of the working of the things of God that allows for you to call out the strategy of the enemy. If I didn't have a full understanding of what it means to not bow before anyone else but my heavenly father, I could have been tricked to reduce myself into a beast worshiping soul. But guess what? Because I know so much in my heart through the process of meditation, it had gone into my subconscious that they could not even catch me in the sleep. They came in the daytime. I did not fall for their antics. And so they tried to come in the sleep. But because that understanding was full within me of the mystery of the working of the honor of the name of God, they could do me no harm. The Lord is inviting you to receive a full understanding of how your defense system works from God's perspective. So that your heart will no longer be afraid. Let's do these seven confessions real quick and we're going to break bread. I want you to say that I will not be afraid of the arrow that flies by day. I will not be moved by what anyone says outside of God's word. I will stand in God's love, confident in his grace. And I will give thanks always. This is the fourth one. The fourth one is Lord. 
let me speak your word that which is true that which is of a good report that which is of authority that which builds confidence not my own words but your words and father in jesus name from today on i will not just see myself as flesh i will not just see myself as an emotional being but i will see myself as a spirit being in the image and in the stature of christ for those blessings that I've left behind, this is number six. For those blessings that I've left behind, let them be brought to me by your mercy. Your goodness and your mercy to follow me. So all the goodness that I passed by because of laziness, because of ignorance, and because of compromise, your mercy took them for me. Now let them be brought before me in the mighty name of Jesus. And the last one, I want you to particularly tie this one to the body of the Lord Jesus. You see, when Jesus was resurrected, some people no longer recognized him because he looked different. And so I want you to say that as Jesus broke bread and gave to the disciples, who at first did not recognize him but then recognized him as I eat of the Lord's body today I will recognize who I am in Christ Jesus I will no longer see myself as the one that the world has dealt with but I will see myself in the light of the glory of Jesus because he died that I may live that glorified life in Jesus name you may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood praise the Lord so the last thing we're going to do before Alan comes up to close the service and receive the offering is this as we were breaking bread the Lord reminded me that many of us are miracles that have been pending are pending because they are associated with the deliverance of another person so don't let anybody come across as undeserving of your sacrifice let me say this very slowly and I know that I've already seen certain people in the room who have been called by God to go to battle on behalf of another but you concluded within yourself somehow that it's not worth it now, I don't have to do that that's a waste of my time they, they don't even deserve that they didn't even ask me they know that I'm a prayer warrior but they didn't come to me the Lord is saying do it for me for my name's sake when you do things for God I mean for other people for his name's sake, you will begin to see God do things for you for his name's sake. He will come save you for his name's sake. He will bless you for his name's sake. He will prosper you for his name's sake. But some of us, those blessings are hidden in other people's houses. And if we don't go to war on their behalf and pray for them and intercede for them, beginning first of all with at least forgiving them, and seeing them worthy of love, we may be missing that miracle. So I want to encourage you today, when, that Holy, when the Holy Spirit brings that person to your heart, brings that burden to you in the place of prayer, or while you're watching TV, immediately respond in love to say, you know what, I am my brother's keeper. And I am going to go to battle that this one is not going to be lost on my watch. They don't have to be deserving of it. It was why we were yet seen as that Jesus died for us. So while they were yet hating on you and talking evil about you, you should go to battle on their behalf. God did not make them to be tail bearers. It was Satan who turned them into those loose cannons. So it is your place to partner with God in bringing them back. And the last thing we're going to do, and I want us to pray for this one. I want us to just rise if we don't mind and just pray for this one. We're going to pray 
for all the young people in our lives. Every young person that you know. You may not be able to call all of them by their names right now. But I just want you to say like Jesus says of the ones the father has given to me. None shall be lost. Jesus prayed to the father when he was getting ready to go to the cross. Because he knew that he was going to fight Satan and the hordes of hell. But then at the same time he did not want to leave his disciples just to chance. So he took them to the father in John 17. He says, look at the ones you have given to me. He says, I want you to keep them in the world. He says, do not let any evil before them. Let none of them be lost. He said, except for the son of perdition who left the fold. Because the father's commitment is to secure the fold. So everyone that God has given to us, male, female, boys, girls, toddler, teenager, infant, none of them shall be lost. Now, I want to say this to you. Brace up because this is something that I thought of carefully before asking for the Lord to give it to us. Okay? So brace up. Some of y'all in the next couple of days the Lord would allow for you to see who those young people truly are. The reason why you've not been praying for them as you should is because some of them have a cloak that they put on when they are around you but you don't know what they're doing. When the Lord revealed it to me, I said, Lord, what do we do? He said, people will pray right if they can see. So I pray for you today that any child around you that is putting up a pretense, that is putting on a facade, that is making you, that is making you feel like everything is okay with them, the Lord will unveil their cloak for you to see so that you can receive a genuine burden to pray for them. The reason why I said be careful with this one is because you might be scared and want to respond emotionally with a dirty slap. But you should not be emotional. Don't be in the flesh. Be in the spirit. Recognize that it is a privilege that God is extending to you to be able to see that child for who that child really is so that you can lay the axe to the roots and deal with the problem for them to be genuinely free. We have had too many stories. We have heard too many stories lately of Satan snatching children from parents, snatching nieces from uncles, snatching students from schools for us to assume that it is just what is going around. No. We need to pray now so that they are not preyed upon. The Lord would have me ask you, and I want you to bear with me, I, I know it's, some people are tired already, but I want you to bear with me one more time. One more moment. Hear this. The Lord asked me just now as I am standing here to ask you if you're ready to partner with him to rescue them. You see, God doesn't ask things like that just so that you can fill the form and come in. No, he's asking you because he wants you to bring out his nature that is in you. There is a nature of God that is in us that is called faithfulness. You know, God is faithful. And in us, sometimes it looks like doggedness, consistency. God wants to know that you will not chicken out until you see Christ formed in them, the hope of glory. You are not praying to check a box. You are praying to save lives. Let me tell you something. You are not praying to check a box. You are praying to save lives. So you need to put your foot down and say, Lord, I'm with you because you are with me. Let's go and set the captives free. Father, I'm going the name of Jesus. One more time, I just want to ask you. The Lord is saying, are you with me? Father, we are with you to do battle alongside with you as good soldiers of the cross because we know that victory is imminent. We know that this victory is inevitable. We're fighting from a place of authority. We're commanding this victory because it's already settled in heaven. So Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, of the ones that you have given to us, none shall be lost except for the son of perdition. But the ones that you have given to us, you have given to us for signs and for wonders. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you. In Jesus' name, if you need healing in your body, lay your hands upon your head. This was already settled while the worship was on. The Lord already revealed to me by the ministry of his angels that there is healing in this place for any physical infirmity. We are in our season of bread. 
and healing is the children's bread. So lay your hands upon yourself wherever you are. If you feel the urge to run here very quickly for a quick word of agreement and a laying on of hands, do that very quickly. But healing is yours and it is yours today in the mighty name of Jesus. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter how long you have been troubled by it. Do not wait until tomorrow. Seize the word of God today and let it be unto you according to your faith in the mighty name of Jesus. Anybody with infirmity, discomfort in your body, lay your hands right now. Even I am laying on my, my hands on my face. I'm not just saying, I'm not going to just say, oh, it's just an allergy. It's going to go. I want it to go now. I want it to go now. So don't you say, well, it runs in our family. I just need to keep taking the meds. No, it can go now because you are of the family of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are of the family of faith and victory is yours and it is yours today in the mighty name of Jesus. All right, I'm just going to touch a couple of people. Brother, Brother Don, I want you to come forward. I see you laying your hands upon your shoulders. I'm going to pray for you. No matter what that is, it's not going to be with you when you wake up. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. Is this the shoulder that you were holding on to? Lord, in Jesus' name, I want you to stretch that hand out as much as you can. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you because you are the glory and the lifter. You are the glory and the lifter of our heads. Lord, in Jesus' name, I ask for there to be a lifting. Lord, let this arm be lifted. In the mighty name of Jesus, whatever needs to be mended in here, be mended this moment. Right now. Be mended this moment. Earth, O oh earth, hear the voice of the Lord. Hear the voice of the Lord and receive the life of God that brings comfort to a man and joy from his belly. Right now in the mighty name of Jesus, I restore to you in the name of the Father your peace, in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. You are made whole. It is well with you. I want you to raise that arm again. Put it back down where it was. And just raise it again. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, any memory of the pain, any memory of the discomfort that is still telling these nerves that it isn't done, let it receive repentance today in the mighty name of Jesus. This very moment, let there be a change of heart because what you have done, you have done and Lord will believe your word. So Lord, in Jesus' name, let this man's tissues and nerves and bones receive this life because it has been declared. In the mighty name of Jesus. Brother Don, it will not arise with you when you wake. You have been set free. And whom the sun sets free is free indeed. I want to pray for you, my sister Nicole. Because when I was talking about the burden of others, I could literally see the burden of others around you. You see what I mean? And the burden of others, there are burdens that you have looked at and thought to yourself, um, yeah, maybe this one is a waste of time. Maybe this one is a distraction. For a season, you operated like that and it was wisdom just to preserve your energy, to preserve your strength. But the Lord says now that you have more power because of all those needs. You understand what I mean? So he's empowered you ahead of time. You just need to rise to the occasion. Every single one of their burdens, the Lord has given you the equipping. Some of them you would only say a word. And some of them you would help them to push it over the hill. You understand what I mean? And so when they're pushing it and it's pushing back on them, you be their support and you push them and you keep pushing with them until it is completely over the hump and both or all of you can heave a sigh of relief. Don't worry, you will not even know where the strength is coming from because the strength is already come. It's just unfamiliar. That's why you didn't recognize it. But the Lord says that I've empowered you. Let there be a leveling of your shoulders. Those places wherein you have felt more of the burden than the other there is a leveling that is going on right now the lord is imbuing in you with strength he is filling you with strength the power is already around you now you can draw strength from it in the name of jesus father we thank you for the oil of the anointing very quickly alan if you can bring me the oil of the anointing you see there is a special anointing today and that was what i was alluding to when i was using chris as an example you see that anointing is what will bring you to the place of being able to say as the Lord is so I am you see as the Lord is the burden bearer so are you because you are operating in his anointing and by his unction this is God's way of bringing out messages that you have preached in practical form 
You see, these are some of the things that you have taught. These are some of the things that you have even considered putting in the book. And the Lord says, I want it to be put out as a fruit. It's going to be out there. People will see it as a living epistle. You see, the recipients of the power of God in your life will go to places that you may not go to. They will carry the word further than you in the, mat in the matter name of Jesus. Actually, hold on, not this one. I want you to just bend your head a little bit for me. Give me the oil of the anointing. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, as you have shown to me in divine obedience, I anoint this woman for testimonies, for miracles, and for deliverance. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Because from here, it is unto the delivery room. And you will help them to deliver those miracles. Because God has raised you a midwife in the life of those that have been weak in the life of those that have been troubled the lord is raising you a midwife you will help them to deliver in the name of jesus father in jesus name we'll give you praise lord jesus father we thank you and i just want us every one of us to be seated we're just going to be seated one more minute Alrighty. and so here is the deal i see people in here as i was leaving that place and your heart was saying before the lord i want to have dreams i want to have dreams and the Lord showed to me that the dream screen in your life was never turned off. It was just covered with cobwebs. And so right now in the matter name of Jesus, I want you to actually demonstrate to yourself by faith that you're clearing the cobwebs. Pull them away from the screen. The Lord wants to speak to you, wants to reveal things to you in your dream space. It was never turned off because it's a gift of God. And the Bible says that the gift and the callings of God, they are without repentance. God does not change his mind. That's what it means about the gifts that he has given to you. But certain things have clogged them. If you would see me after the service, in fact, I'm going to tell you right now, a man clogged your screen. A man clogged your screen. And so you need to stand in the place of prayer and tell the man to sit down. Because you need to see. Those ones that have been exalted in your heart because you allowed them needs to be put back in their place that you may see. You see, you're not supposed to just see through your pain. You're supposed to see vividly. Okay? The man needs to be out of the way. And the Lord will show you exactly. As I'm speaking to you, this word of God is wisdom that will reveal to you what you must do. It is your time to see. You see, because what is interesting about this woman singing is she has a school that she's not even aware of yet that would teach people how to see. It doesn't have to be a formal school, so you don't have to go register anything. But it is an opportunity, a platform that God has for you to teach others how to see. You see, but you have to see first. And you need to know how to take down that which is obstructing your view so that you can help others. Folks, we have we have moved to a different season at Communion House. Let's keep drinking. Let's keep drinking of the well. God bless you. Alan. Hallelujah. Let's give God praise for what he's done. I'm not going to hold this tonight. We have the uh, tithing offerings. Slide on the screen if you need an envelope. It's there to my left, your right. And uh, we're just going to give in praise and thanksgiving, a posture of gratitude for what the Lord has done um, in this house tonight. So much impartation, so much stirring up tonight. And uh, Father, we give you praise for by the leading of your Holy Spirit, you have led us here tonight. You've led us here to the water. You've helped us to drink. Oh God. We thank you for this night of activation. So as you're preparing your offerings, let's give in faith. We'll wait just a couple of more seconds and we will bless it. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise for your word declares that you give seed to the sower. Lord, that you own the cattle on a thousand hills. Everything belongs to you. Father, tonight, let these offerings be pleasing and we give, oh God, in faith. We give in partnership. We give in praise. We give in thanksgiving. We give in adoration unto you tonight. Because you are God. 
and there was none like you. Father, we thank you even if you have declared tonight that this is a new day in communion house, that this is a new season. Oh God, Father, we give you praise because you make us to walk upon our high places. We declare that all glory and honor belong to you. And everyone said, Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just uh, want to give one reminder. The builder men, the men of this house, we had such a great time of fellowship this morning. If there are some men that you know, uh, even fellas here, that you have not been to a breakfast yet, please come fellowship. Let iron sharpen iron. We've just been having uh, a glory to glory type of fellowship every meeting. So we give God praise for that. Okay. And um, if you need, which I know you need, some cards to give out. Okay. We have not let up on that campaign to bring folk into the ark. All right. It's our season to declare coming to the ark. And those that know, know. And so we give God praise for that. So I want us to tap into some of the connect cards and some of the business cards here that we can give out this week coming up. All righty. Let's give God praise again. Just go out in celebration for what the Lord has done. Hallelujah. Everyone have a blessed night.